Hello students, looking at current affairs for 12th June, the news items picked up from the Hindi newspaper are these 14, we look at them in detail. The first one, Supreme Court orders release on bail of journalist arrested in UP. So the Supreme Court has ordered the immediate release of journalist Prashant Kanojia on bail saying that it had no intention to sit back and watch citizen deprived of his personal liberty for social media posts. So he, this has been in news for the last two days. Uh, other journalists have also been arrested uh, as such. And he was also arrested allegedly for sharing a video on social media of a woman claiming that she had sent a marriage proposal to UP Chief Minister Yogi Adityanath. So UP police arrested him. So the Supreme Court has granted him bail and it has said yes, these sort of tweets should not be made but to arrest him is the huge question mark. It says liberty guaranteed under fundamental rights is sacrosanct. So he should not have been arrested. He should be immediately granted bail. The court has called the action taken by UP government a glaring case of deprivation of liberty which uh, in which the citizen had been sent to custody for 13 to 14 days. So you can see that Supreme Court has rightly, the vacation bench of the Supreme Court has rightly granted him bail. The next is wreckage of missing AN-32 spotted in Arunachal. So Indian Air Force has said that the wreckage of Indian Air Force AN-32 transport aircraft that went missing around eight days ago, we had seen this in news, with 13 personnel on board has now been located in Arunachal Pradesh. There were a huge number of uh, you know, vehicles, uh, uh, un unmanned area vehicles and other transport aircrafts which were searching for it and now it has been, I, I, I don't know, it, the wreckage has been identified. Then next is GDP growth overestimated during 2011 to 2017. So this is former chief economic advisor Arvind Subramaniam. He has said that India's GDP growth in the period 2011 to 2017 is likely to have been overestimated. And the tag for the fastest growing major economy may not hold. So it is his research paper which he has published as such. The Harvard University has published it. It's titled India's GDP misestimation likelihood, magnitudes, mechanisms and implications. So he argues in this that the GDP growth during this period was actually 4.5% rather than the 7% which official data claims. So Mr. Subramaniam, he was the chief economic advisor from October 2014 to June 2018 and the period of his research coincides with this part too. So this period of overestimation and he has stressed in his paper that uh, what the paper deals with is the technical origins of the overestimation and not the political aspect. So, responding to such claims of Mr. Supramanya, Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation has reiterated its stance saying that the methodology it adopts is in line with international standards set by UN and, uh, and was robust. Also, a former statistician, former chief statistician of India, Mr. Pranav Sen, he is an expert on India's GDP calculation, also has countered Mr. Subramaniam's uh, viewpoint and says that it's actually based on the methodology which he has used. So Mr. Subramaniam says that the GDP numbers are high, but then this does not correlate with other indicators of economic growth. So this, this why is it so is explained by Mr. Pranav Singh. He says that Mr. Subramaniam in his paper says that other indicators of economic growth which are there apart from GDP is electricity consumption, two-wheeler sales, airline passenger traffic, index of industrial production, export figures, etc. So all these, even if these are low, GDP figures are high. So that correlation is not there. That is the reason why he says that GDP was overestimated. So on this former chief statistician of India, Mr. Pranav Singh says that the methodology is different. He says that from the year which he has mentioned, 2011 onwards, methodology was changed. Shift in methodology in 2011. So what was this? We'll see. He says that GDP growth can come from three distinct factors. One, he says, is growth in volumes, that the amount that is produced. Second, he says, is growth in productivity. So if productivity increases, of course, volume would also increase. And third is improvement in product quality. So it is product production, that is volume, productivity and product quality. So, so here you can say, see that he says that there was shift in methodology in 2011. He says that was the value of goods and services were now considered to estimate, uh, which were considered uh, to estimate growth and not their volume. So the value of goods, not the volume, the quantity was not considered, the value, the price was considered. So this was a change which was done in 2011. So Subramaniam argues that this shift in 2011 for using values rather than volumes meant the price changes 
especially in important inputs such as oil would have big impact on final growth number so if you are considering the value value of production so value means if, if you know, inputs input prices like oil prices are going high then the input cost goes high so then the values in terms of values also it would be costly so that way gdp figures in that sense also if input price go high then value then by value also the gdp should fall so this is also the argument that price changes uh, have to be uh, will have a big impact on the final growth numbers so it's it said under the old established based establishment based gdp estimates price changes mattered less because real growth numbers were largely based on volumes and not value not the value of good but the volume of good but under the new system value has to be deflated by prices to get real magnitude so and this matter is crucial for the manufacturing sector especially where uh, the changes in oil prices have very heavy influence on input costs so this argument of mr subramaniam uh, mr arvin subramaniam the former c chief economic advisor ca in his paper is actually acknowledged by the indian former indian statistician of india mr pranab singh that you know this is a problem with the new methodology which should be addressed that price changes will have uh, their consequences if input prices increase etc and then another point which mr arvin subramaniam points out is the fact the way that informal sector in india is measured so he says informal sector growth is also measured using the same formal sector proxies so this is a highly in inaccurate approach this too is a, a correct assessment according to mr pranab sen so mr subramaniam's papers and other points has been acknowledged by dr pranab sen and he says that this problem has become even more acute post demonetization when the informal sector's growth has fallen now so this is also a problem with uh, estimation of good eventually as a conclusion mr subramaniam uh, the implications which he has derived from his findings in his paper he says there are three things which have to be looked into first is that uh, growth needs to be restored to high levels because if, if saying growth estimation is low this is an important task for the government second he says the quality and integrity of integrity of data in india needs to be improved this has been pointed out quite often by other economists also so mr subramaniam also concludes so in his paper and third he says that india must restore the re reputational damage suffered to data generation across the globe so this is the point also he says that there is a need for a creation of a task force to revisit the entire methodology and implementation of gdp estimation then next is gujarat put on high alert as cyclonic storm vayu inches towards coast so cyclonic storm vayu has intensified into a severe cyclonic storm and it is forcing authorities to put gujarat on high alert gujarat government has ordered to gujarat schools for 3 days in coastal districts and has asked fishermen to return to the coast from high seas so the cyclonic storm is likely to strike from arabian sea on the gujarat coast it's moving towards no gujarat uh, goa gujarat and maharashtra so mumbai region but it's uh, it's likely to move northwards and cross gujarat coast this is vayu cyclonic storm vayu the next is 28 children die of brain fever in bihar so at least 28 children have died in the past one month in muzaffarpur district of north bihar allegedly due to aes acute encephalitis syndrome which is locally known as chamki bukhar brain fever so it generally hits those children who go to sleep empty stomach at night and eat lychees fallen on ground so earlier three different teams of doctors have reached three different conclusions about the reason of the children's death in summer season in muzaffarpur in, in muzaffarpur district in north bihar so high temperatures along with excessive humidity is also considered to be an ideal situation for the outbreak of acute encephalitis syndrome which has symptoms of high fever vomiting nausea and unconsciousness Since 2010, it is said 398 children have died in Muzaffarpur due to acute encephalitis syndrome. So, what is this? Encephalitis, as such, is a disease that affects the human brain. So, it it causes acute inflammation. So, when it also affects the meninges, the outer brain uh, covering, as such, it is termed as meningoencephalitis. So encephalitis is basically in uh, that which uh, causes inflammation in human brain tissues. Then, acute encephalitis syndrome is caused by different viruses. so that one of them is also japanese encephalitis so this is also when a person tests positive for japanese encephalitis causing virus he is said to have acute encephalitis syndrome 
and majority of encephalitis syndromes it is said have no definite treatment and only supportive care is provided so it's a vector borne disease and it affects children uh, more so which are who are prone to mosquito bites and there are other causes also but this is also so this is one of the popular causes and the uh, and the symptoms we already saw headache fever convulsions such the next is amitabh's twitter data put on dark web so hours after twitter account of amitabh bachchan was hacked indian crime agency cyber crime agencies have come across a chat on dark web claiming responsibility for the attack so hackers have also allegedly hacked the twitter account of singer adnan sami so amitabh bachchan's account sr bachchan senior bachchan was hacked and his display picture was replaced by that of pakistan prime minister imran khan and it is alleged that it was a middle eastern hacker who had hacked the account and there was a chat on the dark web where he claimed responsibility for it so the term dark web is important here you should know what is dark web so the web which we access in general is the surface web where you have various websites open websites deep web is uh, aspects which can be taken which can be you know accessed only through uh, security you know, through login and credentials being identified so like academic information put forth medical records or legal documents so all that is on the internet but then needs uh, access it to it through secured access to it so that is the deep web and then you have the dark web so this dark web is where illegal information and you know pure encrypted sites are there which cannot come in google searches also drug trafficking sites and private communications so this is the dark web which is also part of the internet then next is new agency to develop space warfare weapon systems so to enhance the capabilities of the armed forces to fight wars in space government has approved setting up of a new agency which will develop sophisticated weapon systems and technologies so this is called defense space research organization so we have drdo defense research and development organization now this is space research organization so this is interested with the task of creating space warfare weapon systems and technologies so this is a new agency established there is also already an agency called defense space agency so this agency is uh, one which comprises of members of all three uh, defense force uh, personnel that is the integrated defense staff officers tri service integrated defense staff officers means the army navy and air force with whom it would work in close coordination even the defense space research organization so there will be a team of scientists in dsro which would be working in close coordination with the officers and the defense space agency is already there so dsro will provide research and development support to defense space agency so this is defense related authority it has been created to help the country fight wars in space and this will develop weapon systems for defense space agency so this is the defense space agency has been built up in bengaluru under the air vice marshal rank officer and will gradually take over the space related capabilities of all three armed forces army navy and air force so this is the fourth arm as we say even usa is developing fourth arm to the armed forces so this is a defense space agency the space warfare so in this context we have also carried out a anti missile anti satellite test so that was in 2019 march when we demonstrated our capability to shoot down satellites and we joined an elite club of four nations with similar capabilities so these are usa ussr and china so india becomes the next nation to have this capability then this is regarding how all stakeholders from military and space scientific community will take part in this uh, you know exercise to grasp strategic challenges in space and uh, you know that need to be handled and assess capabilities india needs to ensure it can protect its space assets so china also recently was in news launched a rocket with seven satellites from a ship so in that context we have this defense space research organization and there is already a defense space agency which has begun to take shape So it's amalgamating, amalgamating various defense-related, defense-space-related agencies under the three armed forces wings. Then next is Quad. One way to fix regional issues. Australian envoy. So this is Australia's High Commissioner to India, Harinder Sudhu. She says that Quad is developing as a substantive forum to discuss wide range of issues. You should know about the Quad grouping. that is quadrilateral grouping so that comprises of four nations india australia japan and usa so the quad grouping was revived in 2017 but then it has shied away from the military aspect to it 
it has been opposed by china so it basically is for protection of uh, rights as such rights of passage and uh, uh, on free access to the indo pacific region so the last meeting of quad was held in may 2019 last month in bangkok and the military aspect to it it is seen there is this exercise malabar exercise which is conducted in the indo pacific region and india japan and usa participate in it australia had requested to join it but india did not respond positively to that we have bilateral naval exercises in australia called austin lex so that has been done in april 2019 So you should know about Malabar exercise too in the Indo-Pacific region, the Quad grouping, as such. This was exercise Malabar in 2018, trilateral naval exercise, India, USA, and Japan. Then next is Trump again points to high Indian tariffs on Harley bikes. So India's high import tariff on iconic Harley Davidson motorcycles have come in for criticism again by U.S. President Donald Trump. Earlier too, he had criticized India. Earlier had 100% tariff. On Harley Davidson motorcycles means whatever be its price, there will be hundred percent tariff. Means price would double in India on import. So uh, it has actually been reduced by fifty percent now. So fifty percent tariff is still there, and President Trump says that it is still unacceptable. It should be going down to zero because Indian bikes imported by USA are not uh, having high tariffs. So you know, recently also we have seen how India has been targeted. And it has been excluded from the generalized system of preferences program as such. So India is no longer a beneficiary under this, in which it it uh, gets the benefit of uh, reduced tariffs or zero tariffs against various goods. So this is regarding a trade war between India and USA. How in USA is putting pressure on India because we have we have a trade surplus with USA. So this is how U.S. President Donald Trump has been raising this issue of Harley Davidson bikes, the high tariffs, as such, as one prominent example since Feb 2017. So finally, we reduced, but then in Feb 2018, but uh, U.S. President Trump says this is not enough. Then this is regarding India-U.S. trade relations. You can see the trade surplus which India has over the years. It's 21.3 billion dollars now. And we have been, you know, excluded from the GSP program. We we still have, uh, you know, we are still trying to get back our rights under the GSP program to be included again under the GSP program. So India is open to cutting import duties if US renews its eligibility to the GSP market access program. The next is China getting decimated by tariff war. So U.S. President Donald Trump has concluded that his tariff threat worked and forced Mexico to Mexico to stop the flow of migrants. So this case we had recently seen how Mexico was threatened with tariffs reaching up to 25 percent if it does not stop stop migrants. And a new deal was finalized. The agreement was finalized between U.S. and Mexico, where Mexico took significant steps to ensure that migrants do not enter from its border into U.S. Migrants from Central America. So he, President Donald Trump, calls it a Trump and says that uh, he is going to hit Beijing with more tariffs too now till it does not accept till it accepts America's trade demands. So China also has a huge trade surplus with USA. So President Trump continues to increase, you know, threaten tariffs, and he again said that he would place 25 percent tariffs on another 300 billion worth of Chinese goods if U.S. President Trump does not meet President Xi Jinping in, of China during his G20 summit in Japan. So this is also stated by him, and also another thing which President Trump speaks of is the Federal Reserve of India, the Central Bank of USA. So it attacks the Federal Reserve for raising the rates. The key interest rates have been raised by Federal Reserve in 2018. So he says this is putting US at a competitive disadvantage to China. It says China has a fairly subservient central bank. It uh, keeps on devaluating the currency as such. Too that all is done by Chinese government and. Even the rates are kept low. Why in USA, Federal Reserve is raising interest rates. So that is there. Also, not just with India and China, USA is at a trade war with the European European as such too. So Trump has also complained about France charging tariffs on Californian wine, while US allows French wine to come in for nothing. And he has said that European Union was attacking US companies, and he said that US should retaliate. So that is the. Scope and range of the trade war which U.S. President Donald Trump has begun. 
the next is zardari handed over to anti craft body for 10 days so this is former president of pakistan asif ali zardari he has been handed over to anti craft body so national accountability bureau has actually accused him of holding holding dozens of bogus bank accounts and it's not just him his sister has also been accused so and he has been handed over to the national anti craft body for questioning now in this regard it's multi million dollar money laundering case so he has been held for 10 days when finally the decision would be taken whether charges should be pressed or dropped against him so several prominent politicians and businessmen have been swept up on corruption charges since prime minister imran khan took office in 2018 in pakistan even earlier prominently news was how former prime minister nawaz sharif was charged of on was actually convicted on corruption charges he is serving a jail term then next is pakistan army tightens grip on tribal belt so this is regarding pakistan military's crackdown on protesters in the northwestern tribal belt in recent days so security forces have asserted themselves as the true masters of justice in the region so actually there has been military presence in this region the western region of pakistan this is called fata federally administered tribal area so it is said that colonial uh, uh, code harsh frontier code set up long ago by british colonial masters is running this region has been running this region and the military had a strong hold here it was in 2018 that pakistan voted to merge these borderlands as such the fata region into the country's political and legal mainstream so this was a positive step taken so there are 5 million people living in this region federally administered tribal area means 50 lakh people so it's a huge majority of them here are ethnic pashtun tribes and they are now because of this 2018 vote going to get same constitutional rights as other pakistanis and this would mean that they can access the national civilian judicial system otherwise this is this region has been run for so many years on harsh frontier courts where each tribal region is put under a near complete power of a single governor so this has been the way the colonial era rule has been going on in this region for so long people protest here there has been this pashtun civilian rights movement ppm which has been established here and its leaders have also been fighting for their rights they are, the residents here have been denied even basic rights like access to lawyers or normal trials and collective punishment for the crimes of an individual are common in this region So this is the system, and the security forces have a stronghold here. And even after this vote, it seems security forces are not ready to lend up, and they have again asserted their presence in the region. And the commanders of the military forces say that they are going to set up an alternative anti-terrorism court system, which will be used to prosecute leaders of the Pashtun protest movement. And the witnesses say that these movements have been peaceful, and still they are talking of anti-terrorism court systems for them. this is the situation here military crackdown on protesters have been seen in recent days here roads have been closed curfew has been imposed so the pashtuns you should know even khan abdul gaffar khan was from this region uh, the freedom fighter who has also been given bharat ratna by india too and if you read history you come to know that how he was saddened by partition where Fata region was they're going to be you know uh, acceded to Pakistan so it was Pakistan which got this territory and this is the situation here so here you can see the Fata region is shown this is Pakistan the major provinces are Sindh Punjab Baluchistan which is an again another area of unrest in Pakistan and then you have this Fata federally administered tribal area so this is there then you here you have the gilgit baltistan region which is actually pakistan occupied kashmir and azad kashmir region so this, is, this comprises um, pakistan occupied kashmir then you have this khyber pakhtunkhwa region also kp region we are talking about the news in news is this region pashtun uh, pashtun dominated region fata the next is dhfl avoids default pays interest on ncds non convertible debentures so divan housing finance limited a non banking finance company has made the entire interest payment of 961 crore rupees on its non convertible debenture holders so it has avoided default on the payment which was actually due on june 4 and it had stated that it has a cure period of 7 working days within which payment could be made and it has you know 
adhered to it and it has made the payment it actually sold its complete stake in aadhar housing finance limited this is not related to aadhar card as such this a company which was an to an entity backed by blackstone group so on this it got 220 crore rupees of which it used 500 crore rupees to pay the non convertible debenture holders and also the delay in payment to non convertible debenture holders we had seen how uh, because of this indian credit rating agency has had downgraded downgraded diwan housing finance limited's commercial papers to junk grade d grade so now it has said that with this payment been done company uh, has confirmed full payment and will be seeking rating upgrades from the agencies too so this is how dhfl is trying to raise funds now through selling of its stakes like this was the case blackstone acquiring aadhar housing uh, and other stakes also how it has sold off and the last news is pv sales that is passenger vehicle sales at new low sector seeks government help so this is a steepest fall to be seen in 18 years that domestic passenger vehicle sales declined by 20.55% in may 2019 so now the automobile sector industry is seeking government's intervention too and it is said the reason for this decline in passenger vehicle sales is because of weak consumer demands because of which even manufacturers have to undertake inventory correction means they also have to uh, Uh, slow down manufacturing in a way or uh, imports or any uh, in that sense so industry body cm that is society of indian auto oil manufacturers have highlighted this case and it has said this has been the steepest decline seen in passenger vehicle sales since september 2001 and it is said the sales are low not just uh, in as such in one segment but in all vehicle segment two wheelers three wheelers commercial vehicles sales are down across all segments as such if seen the may 2019 data is seen so there are various issues it is said high fuel prices high insurance costs and non banking finance companies issues also because of which loans become difficult consumer sentiment is low so the government is asked to intervene government it is said had previously intervened in 2008 9 and 2011 well with cut in excise duty so now cut in gst is proposed as such it's that you know government should reduce gst on all categories of vehicles from 28% to 18% also government should come up with vehicle scrappage policies another demand being made so if uh, it would create market for new vehicles then and the situation may improve too, to some extent in the second half of 2019 because of pre buying before the change to bs6 norms bharat stage 6 norms which will be uh, applicable from 2020 onwards so that would require a change in the engine so before the before bs6 norms come into effect pre buying may take place in 2019 so situation may slightly improve and this is the data given about domestic sales and exports of passenger vehicles in may 2019 so this is the data on the domestic sales the number of units of vehicles sold in all three categories you can see the year on year growth shown is in the negative and overall also it is in the negative exports also the figures are shown and this is year on year growth which is overall in the negative and for utility vehicles and vans it is in the negative so this is the status of automobile sector in india so that is also an indication of economic growth in the country so that is it these are the news items thank you